Thanks for the nice introduction. Thank you for all of my family that's here tonight, uh, and friends and students. Um, so I think I've probably spoken to many of you about all of this already. So we'll see. Um, oh, there's another student just walking by. <laughs> Patrick. Uh, here's an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Let, let's go back to the title here. Uh, Monitoring Climate from Space, Challenges, Opportunities, and Less Contributions. You know, Tom mentioned a, a, a couple of missions uh, related to looking at the sun um, called Source and the Future Thesis, again, which launches next year. Uh, this, the, 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 uh, the heart of this talk is actually looking at the Earth and uh, a new mission that we have and a new instrument that we're building to uh, measure reflected sunlight from the Earth. And so this is a sort of the other side of the, of the equation of climate that we'll talk about. So I'm going to talk a little bit about energy balance and imbalance and why that's important for climate. Uh, I don't want to waste an opportunity to talk about the greenhouse effect um, because um, uh, I think uh, we educators don't always do a great job of explaining the greenhouse and I actually think it's simpler than the way that we usually talk about it and I'll try to introduce a simpler notion of the greenhouse uh, today. Um, and I'm going to talk about climate change. How big is the signal? Um, which gets into the question of how well we have to make our measurements, or how much better we have to make our measurements than, we, than we're currently doing. And so I'll talk about new last measurements at this, uh, what's called the NASA Clario Pathfinder mission for which we are participating in building the primary instrument for that. Have to start with uh, the same way that we start any introduction, introductory um, atmosphere and weather courses that we teach here at the university talking about the difference between climate and weather. Um, you might think it's trivial, but, uh, but it actually isn't. Uh, and the distinction, the distinction is very important, um, especially when we talk about climate. Um, the weather is a condition at a particular moment. You can say that, for example, it's cold tonight, very cold actually, I think we're in single digits now, Fahrenheit at least. Um, uh, I think it's clear, so those are the, 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 we could say that the wind speed is so many miles per hour and the humidity is such and such. Those are, those are elements of weather, the atmospheric pressure is so much. Uh, climate is something different, climate is an average, climate and they're long term averages and we usually don't even begin to discuss climate until we get to periods on the order of decades, okay, maybe three decades. So. Um, uh, the weather of a day or a week or a season or a year does not a climate make, okay? So um, because it's cold in winter, you know, that, that really tells us nothing about climate change. Uh, we have to look over much longer periods. So climate elements, I told you about weather elements, climate elements would be, for example, Boulder averages 88 inches of snow per year. That wasn't just, that's not 88 inches of snow last year, that's over, again, something like a 30 year period or longer. Uh, the average high temperature today is 45.3 Fahrenheit. The average low is 21.5 Fahrenheit. We know from experience that we never have the average weather, right? Today we're much colder. Most of October we were much warmer than the average. Okay, so um, climate remains fairly steady. Weather changes quite a bit as we know. Big changes in weather. What we're interested in is in climate. And we use a diagram like this um, to try to illustrate the, the steadiness of climate. And this is, uh, this shows energy flows through the atmosphere. Uh, and there are three modes of transporting energy in the atmosphere. One is radiation, I'll talk about that in a second. The other two have to do with transport um, from molecule to molecule or mass motions of molecules which transport energy. Those are convection and conduction. Okay, um, so those are, the, those are the methods of transporting energy through the atmosphere. Outside of the atmosphere, the only way that we can, because of its vacuum outside of its atmosphere in space, the only way to transport energy is through radiation. Okay, what is radiation? Um, all matter radiates. Why is that? All matter is made up of charged particles, protons and electrons that are in motion. Moving charges produce 
uh, electric and magnetic waves, those waves carry energy. That's called, that energy is called radiation. In the visible, uh, that's light that we can see, but there's all sorts of other wavelengths that I'll show you in a second here. Um, so, uh, we receive, so from outside of Earth's atmosphere, the only energy that we, well, the only significant energy we receive is, is from the sun. And uh, that's this amount here coming in. Um, the number says 340. Forget what the units are, that doesn't matter, but we can say we have 340 units of sunlight coming. We have energy that's reflected, sunlight that's reflected. That's 100 units that's reflected. But then the Earth, remember we said all matter emits, the Earth is emitting itself, and the amount that escapes is given here. Let's round that off for the moment to 240. We'll see in a second why that round, or later on why that rounding off isn't really, uh, we're not really um, uh, allowed to do that, but for now we'll round that off to 240. Plus 100 is 340, we have 340 coming in. We have the same amount coming in as going out. Okay? That's energy balance. And that is what's required to maintain the climate. And by here, when I say climate, think of it really, let's just talk about temperature, okay? So energy balance and energy is a measure, or sorry, temperature is a measure of energy. And so we can see that if we have energy balance, we have temperature balance. We, have the, we can maintain a climate on Earth that's gonna remain rather steady. Um, if those become imbalanced, temperature can change. If we have more energy radiation leaving the planet, the planet will cool. If we have more entering the planet, the planet will warm. Um, a nice analogy is uh, a bathtub, right? You open a faucet, water flows in, the level of water in the tub increases. You open the drain, water drains out, the level in the tub decreases. If you can match the water leaving the tub with the water entering the tub, you can keep the level the same. So, and, and this analogy is, 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 the analogy is appropriate. You always have flow in and flow out, but you have balance, okay? And balance maintains the climate. When you have imbalance, however, things can change. And there'll be more on imbalance in a bit. Uh, I just love to show this. Uh, I said that we only receive radiation, or we only receive energy from the sun. Uh, I, uh, a student of mine, Andrew Kren, um, did this um, project uh, in his, he's since got his PhD, he works over here at NOAA. Um, he took on a project uh, uh, a few years ago to compile all the sources of, external sources of energy that the Earth receives. And it was kind of a fun project. Uh, I used to show um, the, I used to show a table from, it was from a climatology book by Sellers here, who incidentally was a professor of mine at the University of Arizona, um, and he had this in his textbook, um, and his numbers were from um, famous meteorologist Letow at the University of Wisconsin, who put his table together in the 50s, so even earlier than that, and so nobody's ever really published this stuff, and I used to show these at various meetings. And people would say, "Well, you really have to, um, you really have to update that table." And I thought, "Well, that's that's too hard for me to do, so I think I'll have a student do it." And so that's what uh, that's what Andrew did, and um, it, it is going to be published very soon. The the point of this is just to, just to quantify all these different terms. I'm not going to go through all this. It's, it's it's kind of fun, and we could probably spend the entire hour going through these. Um, but after after the sun, the next largest source of energy which is, so there's that 340 units, but let's just convert that to one and compare all these numbers to that number. The, the next largest source of energy is, is uh, heat from Earth's interior. It's four orders of magnitude, 10,000 times smaller than the sunlight and everything else drops out. Incidentally, quite interestingly, infrared radiation from the full moon is, um, is the next largest source. Uh, and, but further down is reflected radiation from the full moon. Um, these numbers are small, and if you add them all up, you get something that's a few parts in 10 to the minus fourth compared to one. And so, if you look at a pie chart, which we like to do, there it is, and even that little wisp of, a, of all these other sources is exaggerated, um, actually, um, so that you can see it. 
Um, so really, it's, it's the sun, okay? So for balance, we have to counter all of that energy that we receive from the sun. So, but more on balance um, in a moment. So a little, here's a little, little lesson, hopefully brief lesson in radiation, in radi well, not radiation transfer, but radiation and emission. So we said that all matter emits radiation, right? Charges in motion, everything emits radiation. Um, this is what the emission spectrum of the sun looks like. This curve here, and by spectrum I mean that this is the way that the emission changes with wave. This is wavelength on the scale, and this is the way that the emission from the sun changes with wavelength. This is the visible part of the spectrum. This is the part of the solar spectrum that we can see. This is four tenths to seven tenths of a micron. A micron is one millionth of a meter, and everybody knows a meter is about a yard, right? So one millionth of that is a wavelength of light, right? Um, and then we have a break in the scale, okay? So this is, this is the solar, this is the, what we call the near infrared, this is the ultraviolet here. We can't see wavelengths shorter or longer, but there's plenty of radiation from the sun shorter and longer than the visible. However, it does peak around the visible. Then we have a break, and then we go to longer wavelengths. And this is, this is what we call the infrared part of the spectrum, five to 30 microns. Then we have another curve, okay? That's the emission from the Earth. And its temperature is closer to 300. Oh, these are Kelvin. Um, oh, I've converted Kelvins to Fahrenheit's for you in other places, but subtract 273, multiply by two, and add 32, and you can do that. <laughs> I have some examples for you. Um, here's the thing though. So if these are perfect emitters, they will emit exactly like this. This is the most that these bodies will emit. We call these perfect emitters are called black bodies. And the, this curve is actually identical. It scales identically with this. The only difference is that it's, it's a smaller curve and the peak is moved. And the size of this curve, or the area under that curve, and the peak are related only to the temperature. Okay? The sun is much hotter, therefore its peak is at much shorter wavelengths. In fact, it's 20 times as hot as the Earth. Okay? So the Earth has, it peaks at much longer wavelengths, and the total area under this curve is lower. And that is, those are very fundamental laws of radiation that will, that will come into play and we'll talk about. Um, but these are what we call, the, the, these are perfect emitters, meaning that they absorb, they emit everything that they can, they emit by these fundamental laws of emission. They also absorb all the light at these wavelengths, okay? And this is why we call these perfect emitters black bodies. They truly will be black. Um, okay. So the Earth is emitting radiation. The atmosphere is also emitting radiation, okay? The atmosphere is not a perfect emitter like the, the Earth's surface is. So the atmosphere, which is maybe just a little bit cooler than here, will also have an emission curve like this, but it'll have a lot of gaps in it. It won't emit perfectly across that spectrum. It will only emit um, uh, from the gas, the particular gases that, that emit in the infrared. There's most of the gases in the Earth's atmosphere do not emit, emit in the infrared. For example, nitrogen and oxygen have almost no emission in this part of the spectrum. So the water emits radiation around here and out here. Carbon dioxide emits radiation around here. And in between those, there, 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 there's, there's gaps, okay? Which already leads you to the clue when you know, we talked about the greenhouse is that if we can fill in some of those gaps, the atmosphere can emit a little bit better. Okay, so from that we'll talk about these three planets that we know and love, at last especially, um, and everywhere, especially for this one, right? We all know these planets. And I call this a Goldilocks tail. A Goldilocks tail. Um, about about climate. Um, everybody know the Goldilocks uh, story? Okay. So, we have the three planets, and we're going to compare temperatures for those three planets. We're going to look at a temperature of that planet that does, if, if there were no atmosphere on the planet, and then we're going to look at the actual surface temperature of the planet. 
Okay, we're going to compare those two. So we're going to say that the sunlight the planet receives compared to Earth. Earth receives one compared to itself, right? And of this one unit of sunlight, um, 0.3 of that is reflected back to space. So we say the Earth reflects 30% of its radiation back out to space. That means 70%, 0.7 of that, 70% is absorbed by the Earth. That is energy that then is converted to do everything that the Earth does. Move the oceans, move the atmosphere, grow plants, um, photosynthesis, all the things that, all the energy that drives the Earth. Okay? Now, first we're going to look at what, what the temperature of the Earth would be without an atmosphere. And we can actually do this based on those simple radiation principles that I just showed you on the, on the two slides ago. We can actually calculate this quite simply just by knowing this. Just by knowing this, because 70% of this is absorbed, that has to be balanced by how much the Earth emits. And remember I said that those curves were, were, uh, can be determined solely by temperature? Well, uh, that we can calculate this temperature if the Earth reflects this much of this energy. We can actually do the calculation. This is a very, very simple calculation. What is that temperature? 255 Kelvin. Here I did the conversion for you. It's about zero um, Fahrenheit. Not, not too much colder than it is outside right now. What's the actual surface temperature <coughs> of the Earth? The actual is quite a bit warmer. 288 Kelvin average over the whole globe. 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Huh. Okay. Interesting so far. Venus. Does Venus receive more sunlight or less sunlight than Earth? More, right? It's closer. Almost twice as much. Almost twice as much. Does it reflect more of that sunlight than Earth? Yes. Yes. Venus is enshrouded with cloud. Whoop. Oh, well, I wanted to Mars first. Well, I hit the button. Okay, Mars is further away. Mars receives a little less than half as much solar radiation as Earth. Venus reflects more. How about Mars? Reflects more or less than Earth? 0.3. Less. Why less? No clouds on, on Mars. So about 1.7. Uh, 17% of its radiation is reflected back in space. Okay, Venus. Uh, Temperature, what do you suppose Venus's temperature, if Venus didn't have an atmosphere, but it, it still receives this much sunlight and it reflects that much sunlight, would its temperature be higher or lower than Earth? Than Earth's temperature without an atmosphere? Every, anybody who's, did, did take my class, who's not my student can answer this question. No. I know. <laughs> Lower, wow, 230. Even though it's closer, it's twice as much sunlight, 230. That's minus 45 Fahrenheit. Mars? Temperature without an atmosphere? Cooler. Also cooler. 216 minus 71. All right, now let's look at actual surface temperatures. Actual surface temperature, we know here the Earth is 59 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than if it didn't have an atmosphere. Venus, warmer or cooler? Warmer, a little bit warmer? Much warmer. I like that. 700 Kelvin, 800 Fahrenheit. Mars? Well, by all practical, for all practical purposes, Mars doesn't have an atmosphere. So, I mean, don't tell any of my Mars colleagues here. <laughs> You'll probably get your fired at last. <laughs> but it, uh, don't tell Bruce that. Okay. Um, it's about the same. About the same. What have we learned? Anything? Here's the Goldilocks. First, of, okay, well, here's what, here's what I'm going to say. Here, here, here's what I'm going to contend. 
The difference between these temperatures is a measure of the greenhouse effect. If the Earth didn't have an atmosphere, we'd be at zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, there's a huge difference in actual surface temperature to surface temperature without an atmosphere, and no difference. So this is, I say the difference is a measure of the greenhouse. We'd say that this is no greenhouse. There's not enough greenhouse. This is too big of a greenhouse. Here's Goldilocks. That's a just right greenhouse, okay? So is a greenhouse a good thing? You better believe it. You better believe it. And this is the confusion between greenhouse and global warming. Greenhouse is a very important thing. Um, so what is it? Can anybody define the greenhouse effect? <laughs> yeah? It's when the solar radiation from the sun comes to Earth and it hits the Earth atmosphere. Part of the radiation gets trapped within Earth because the atmosphere contains gas that blocks it from escaping and the rest goes out into space. Okay, um, and I'm not going to pick on you, but I'm really happy that you answered that way because you gave a lot of the, a, a lot of the terminology that actually I think adds confusion to the way to, to, to a simpler description of the greenhouse. So before I actually give a simple definition, I will say what it isn't. Okay, what it's not. And the first thing that it isn't is a greenhouse. Okay? Um, now, you, so, and part of the description that you, you said was how um, greenhouses partly work, and that is greenhouses have glass, transparent glass, that allows sunlight to come in. Earth's atmosphere, for the most part, is transparent, about 80%. Well, not quite, about 50% of the radiation reaches the surface, only about 80% of it um, uh, is, is scattered through the atmosphere. It's, it's never absorbed. Um, but, um, uh, I shouldn't say never absorbed, I shouldn't say that. Um, but a, a, the, uh, the, the notion is, is that a greenhouse works by allowing sunlight in and then um, the, uh, the, the structure of the greenhouse, the glass, will absorb infrared radiation, emit infrared radiation. Um, that's really not the whole story. The, the actual, actually the, the greenhouse works the same way your, uh, your car works on a hot summer day when you leave the windows up. Uh, it might be 90 out and your car is going to be about 115 Fahrenheit. Um, and how do, you how do you fix that, by the way? How do you, how do you cool down your car? Really? Or how do you never get it to 115? And, since last has a lot of scientists, you'll see that a lot of the scientists will take action in the morning. What do they do to their car to not so that it's not so hot? The collector and the uh, part of the windshield. Uh, that could that that could work, but there's there's actually something more important. Leave the windows. Simpler. All you do all you do is leave the windows down. Your car gets hot the same way that the greenhouse gets hot. You suppress convection. You su you, you suppress air motion that can, that can um, transport energy um, outside of the car, outside of the greenhouse. The earth doesn't work that way. The, so the earth really is, so the greenhouse is not really an appropriate um, description of this process, the, 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 why the, the surface is warmer in the presence of the atmosphere. Um, so we call it the atmospheric greenhouse effect to make that distinction. For historic reasons, you can't really get rid of the term. So. But here's what it does and also does. The atmosphere does not trap heat, nor does it trap radiation. Radiation is absorbed, um, at which point it doesn't exist anymore. It's converted into other forms of energy. Um, but uh, the, the, the description of trapping um, uh, is, is uh, actually, I think, uh, confuses the issue. Um, the atmosphere does not re-radiate radiation. Re, again, re-radiation is, is, is not really a process. Again, once radiation is absorbed in the atmosphere, it ceases to exist, so it cannot be radiated again. Um, the atmosphere does radiate. It radiates at wavelengths different than the, way, the wavelengths of light that it is absorbed um, because its temperature is different from the source of uh, radiation that it received. Okay? So it doesn't re-radiate radiation. Um, that it hasn't trapped. 
this isn't trapped either. Um, the atmosphere does not act like a blanket. Why does a blanket keep you warm? Same way the greenhouse works, really. The greenhouse actually is like a blanket. It suppresses con convection. Um, the atmosphere promotes convection, okay? So, uh, a blanket is a poor description. So here is the simplest, most direct uh, definition that I like to use. The greenhouse effect, the surface of the Earth is warmer than it would be in the absence of an atmosphere because it receives radiative energy from two sources, the sun and the atmosphere. It's that simple, right? We just said matter radiates. We have a lot of matter above us in the atmosphere. We are receiving radiation from that atmosphere. We're receiving a lot of radiation right now from that atmosphere. We're not receiving any sunlight, but we are receiving energy, radiative energy from the atmosphere. And that's it. And you really don't need anything else to describe it. How much of each of those. How, how much would you guess, and again, none of my students can answer this question, how much solar radiation do you suppose Earth gets compared to infrared radiation from the atmosphere? Receive more radiation from the sun than the atmosphere, a lot more, about the same. Anybody guess? You know. <laughs> Somebody guess. A lot more than the sun. Very good. Let's look at some measurements first. <laughs> so we have the, um, instruments uh, set up. These, uh, this is, these are a couple of instruments that were um, uh, over at Duane Physics Building. They just moved out at the uh, uh, outside of our new, uh, this is ATOC, uh, that's our little emblem down there, Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, uh, at the SIC building here. Uh, the Scott Kittleman set these up. Um, two instruments, one that measures the infrared radiation, that's in the red here, and this black one is measuring the sunlight. And so, for, and this is a day in January of 2014. Right? So first of all, you know, I just said that we're, we're always receiving radiation from the atmosphere. And you know the sun turns off. Well, the sun really doesn't turn off, but we turn away from the sun. So especially in the winter, most of the day we're not getting any sunlight. So if you sum all this up over the entire day, you can imagine though, even though there's spikes in the sunlight, that you probably get more. And that's what these dashed lines indicate, that on this day we got 262, we call this watts per square meter, this is power density, um, the amount of power in every square meter uh, of surface, 262 of the infrared, only 63 of the solar, only 63. So that's, that's a lot more in one day. Um, there's some interesting things going on here. You can see there's, there's, a, there's another element of the greenhouse, a very important element, and that's clouds. And you can see that here, these are anti-correlated, these two signals, um, with clouds. And I'll show you in a second why we know that it's cloud cover. Um, but these, the, um, when the infrared goes down here, the solar goes up, goes back down, the infrared goes up. Um, and the reason is, is that Clouds are very, very efficient at emitting, much more efficient than the cloud-free, than the gases in the atmosphere. In fact, clouds are close to those perfect black bodies that I showed you before. Um, this is another instrument that we have at Skywatch called a, a solometer, which is, uh, measures, the, uh, measures cloud base. And so here on the same day, this is a different time scale. I'll show you where we were compared to that other figure in a second here. But this is, this is low cloud, this is low cloud here. So pretty overcast and the break in between. Um, so if you look here, you'll see these two overcast regions sandwiched around um, broken clouds. If we go back to here, that's essentially what we have here. There is, there's the broken cloud. The infrared goes down when the clouds go away, the sunlight goes way up. What does an entire year um, look like? 
And there you go, Stefan. Here's your credit. This is a, this was a class project in an undergraduate class to take a year's worth of data and to take daily averages, take those, get derive those what, that one number from that full day of data, and then plot that entire year. And so the blue is the solar radiation, radiation from the sun. The red is the infrared radiation. And these are the these are the averages over the entire year. We get we got an average of 190 watts per square meter of sunlight, 309 watts per square meter of infrared. Okay, over 60 percent more infrared than we got. Um, these big these big oscillations are due to clouds. Okay, um, and then we see by the seasons things pretty much go as you expected. The summer. We, the, the solar and infrared are a lot closer, but in the uh, winter and uh, fall, um, they're, they're quite, a bit, uh, quite a bit more radiation from the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is an important source of radiation, and it's an important source of, of, uh, of, of energy for the, for the surface, and essentially that is the greenhouse. So those are the numbers. Globally averaged, that chart that I showed you at the start of the talk, um, actually had these numbers. You could have looked and cheated if you looked at those numbers. We actually get, that, that says globally we get about 80% more infrared radiation from the atmosphere than we do from the sun. Radiation from the sun. Boulder, at least for that year, was a bit lower. It was 63% more infrared. But you can explain this pretty easily. Boulder is a pretty sunny place, right? So not a lot of clouds. Remember, clouds really enhance the infrared radiation, so this ratio is a little bit lower. Okay. Um, so there's our definition of the greenhouse. It, it's a, it gets a little more complicated because now we want to talk about we want to talk about a changing greenhouse. And remember, I said that most of the gas in the atmosphere, nitrogen and oxygen, is transparent to infrared radiation. It also doesn't emit. Um, there's a law which states that if 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 gases absorb radiation, they'll also emit radiation um, at the same rate. Uh, it's essentially a conservation of energy principle. Um, but there are what we call greenhouse gases or infrared active gases that absorb in the infrared and they are responsible for the emission of the atmosphere. And those greenhouse gases are gases you've heard about, carbon dioxide, methane, um, the most important infrared gas is water vapor, and there's a bunch of other trace constituents. So these gases are responsible for, for the Earth's atmosphere emission. So can this greenhouse be strengthening? Uh, you bet it can be, and um, no doubt it, it is. Um, there are uncertainties in climate science. There are uncertainties in climate change. But when we start from basic principles, there are certain things that we know for sure. Um, one of them is that carbon dioxide has been increasing. And this is a 400,000 year record. Uh, this comes, and, and we did not have uh, instruments on Mauna Loa measuring these. <laughs> For, uh, 400,000 years ago, this is the derived by looking at ice cores. Um, this is at the Vostok station in the Antarctic, but we can get pretty accurate readings of carbon dioxide, and things were oscillating um, fairly regularly here. But then, um, starting in the, in the present epoch, uh, around the time of the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, we've seen this huge increase. Um, so we were between about 180 and 280 parts per million um, of carbon dioxide per, uh, in, in the atmosphere, parts per million, so 280 parts per million by volume of carbon dioxide molecules compared to all the other molecules in the atmosphere, we have just um, surpassed 400 parts per million. Okay, so we've increased the greenhouse gas and uh, an infrared active gas in the atmosphere. We have strengthened the greenhouse. These are, these, is, these are things that we know for sure. The consequence of this is that this, um, th th this uh, uh, warms the lower atmosphere increases evaporation rates, increases water vapor in the atmosphere, which amplifies the greenhouse even more. Um, but then other things happen. You put more clouds or less clouds or change the water in the atmosphere, 
And this is where climate uncertainty begins, and this is part of the reason why our climate projection, projections change. But these are, these are things we know for sure, okay? That we have amplified um, the greenhouse uh, effect. Um, but there is very strong evidence that, in fact, um, the, 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 the climate is changing. Um, uh, not necessarily exactly the way the models have projected, but in manners similar to some of the, some of the models for sure. Um, something that is not necessarily my favorite variable to look at, something called the, uh, the global mean temperature. Um, but if you look at a 140 year average, the global mean temperature has changed by one and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Um, 0.87 degrees Celsius, um, but there's other there's other things, and, and there's and as you well know, there's a lot of regional variability with temperature, but there's other things that are really strong indicators of climate change. Uh, sea level rise, this is unmistakable. Sea level sea levels have risen um, by 17 centimeters, almost seven inches in the last century. Um, so, you know, 17 inches per centimeter, but just the last decade, it's about double. The, the rate is double that, so it's increasing. Coastal regions are in jeopardy. Um, and there's a, there's a, this is a 20-year uh, record of sea level rise, um, 80 millimeters, eight, uh, in just the last uh, 20 years. Um, but I think probably the most stark uh, examples of climate change are changes in ice on the planet. And part of the reason is that, that, the, that the polar regions are, are changing more rapidly than, than anywhere else on the, on the globe. Um, it, but the reason that it's very impressive is that it takes a lot of energy to melt ice. Uh, and ice is melting, both on land and in the sea. Uh, and the Antarctic is losing 120 gigatons of ice per year. The Greenland ice sheets are lo is, is losing 280 gigatons of ice per year. There's the, uh, this is Greenland here. Uh, since um, uh, in, in, in a little more than a decade uh, has lost, what is that, about 4,000 gigatons of ice. That's a lot of ice. Uh, and uh, the uh, Arctic, the, the, the water, the, uh, the ice in the oceans uh, is, is decreasing substantially as well. Um, the, the sea ice minimum, there's a minimum in, in, in the sea ice extent uh, in late summer every year before it starts growing again. And every year, what remains left of the, uh, of the Arctic sea ice is less and less. Um, some projections say that um, in a little more than a decade, the Arctic uh, oceans will be seasonally ice-free, meaning the ice will grow back, but it'll actually uh, completely melt or nearly completely melt um, over the summer. Uh, I have a little movie to show here. Whoops, maybe. There we go. Since 1980, the disappearance of sea ice in the Arctic has accelerated drastically reducing the floating mass of older and thicker sea ice that once stretched from parts of Greenland and Alaska all the way to Siberia. Scientists have determined the total area of older sea ice in the region is now declining at a rate of 17% per decade, a trend strongly tied to rising temperatures in the Arctic. Um. Over the last decade, I think three or four of the years have seen record lows. Uh, I don't know about this year. Do you, was, was, was this year a record, Sebastian? Do you know anything? 2012 was certainly a record of uh, sea ice minimum, but uh, I don't know if this one was. Okay, so we're pretty sure that climate is changing. Are we measuring that? Are we actually tracking climate change from space? Um, Surprisingly, we're not. Uh, and that's not an indictment of, um, of the tremendous work, uh, the tremendous research that's been done um, by NASA and other international space agencies over the last two decades. Um, but what we, what we really measure in, from space right now are what we call climate processes. 
we can tell how much of the earth is cloud covered and how thick those clouds are and how much sea ice for example there is on the planet and what is the composition of the atmosphere and things like that um, but we don't really track how well it changes okay and 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 this might come this might be a surprise to some this shows the um, constellation of satellites known as the uh, uh, NASA Earth Observing System, and uh, somewhere here, there's the, there is the uh, last source spacecraft there. There are a few of these instruments that actually you would say that are making climate quality measurements, and um, that's actually one of them. We actually do measure the sun within climate quality constraints. We can actually see changes small enough that really matter for climate. Um, but most of these others, again, we, we say they, 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 measure, they, they help us to understand climate processes. And we've learned a lot about the present climate. Um, but not, we can't necessarily say, well, one decade ago, um, the average cloud thickness on the planet was this much, and this has changed by this much. Uh, we can't really do that with any sort of accuracy. Okay. So why do we need to improve our climate observing system. Okay. As you see the first bullet there. There's relatively little doubt um, that the climate, the climate change is occurring. And in fact, I mean, we know we, we use the name climate deniers to, the, uh, to, to uh, describe people who deny that climate is changing. But I would say that climate deniers don't even deny that climate is changing. They deny maybe the source of change of climate. Um, but but uh, uh, but even 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 the e even the harshest of skeptics um, are, are coming to accept that, that things are changing and uh, changing seemingly rapidly. Um, so do we need to do, do we need to spend resources to observing the system? Maybe we need to you know use all those resources to just adapt to that change or mitigate the change. Um, but we really, we're, we, we, we really can't do that. We really do need improved observations. Um, because of our ability, our, our ability to predict, because we're not able to really detect change from space, we can't really um, forecast the future very well with our climate models. Uh, and those uncertainties in climate change lead to bigger uncertainties in economic impacts of climate change. There's a lot of complicated factors um, that's well beyond the scope of this talk, but you can guess when we talk about things like rising sea level, melting sea ice, um, you know, desertification of, 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 of continents, things like that, there will be major economic impacts. Um, so because we, we have large uncertainties and economic impacts, we can't really do cost-benefit analysis that tell us, hey, if we reduce emissions by this much, we can actually save this much in the future. Um, we have uncertainties with this, and policymakers, until they see some certainty in these models, they're going to be reluctant to really do something, do something of significance. Okay. Better observations will reduce those uh, uncertainties, enable sound response strategies that will have significant economic impacts. Um, by the middle of, whoops, I missed, the, missed this by 100 years. By the middle of this century, and this should be 2050, it could cost as much as $500 billion a year to adapt to climate change, okay? So we're talking about trillions of dollars of, uh, of savings, um, but we need to get the right measurements up now. And what are the, what 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 is the what's the significant difference in um, in the way we're doing? What improvements do we need to make in our climate observing system? And it's essentially accuracy. We don't make accurate enough measurements. So I said I was going to show you this again. Um, the, there's a number here and there's a number at the top there that shows an imbalance, okay? This, this, that imbalance is a half or six tenths of a watt per square meter. Remember we had 340 coming in. We measure this from space. We measure this from space. We're currently doing it with source. We're doing in another uh, mission called the Hopefully by next year we'll be doing the thesis. 
We have other measurements that measure the reflected radiation and measure the emitted radiation. And so the question is, does what comes in, does that match what's going out? Um, and we don't make, the, we make this measurement accurately enough. We don't make those, this measurements are very difficult. We don't make these accurately enough. But we can guess by the changing temperatures, by the changing climate, that there is about a half a watt per square meter imbalance. Okay? Now it's not enough to just say, well, we have to measure these within a half a watt per square meter um, because we have to measure that, that difference at some accuracy. We'd probably like to measure that at a, at, at a few percent. So it means measuring this, these numbers here, on the order of one tenth of a percent to even close to a hundredth of a percent. These are tremendous challenges. We're meeting it with this. We're on the road to meeting of this, but uh, that's, that's the next step. And here's one for the thesis folks, John. I, did, I had to say something about the sun, but you know, I always like to say, um, you know, in, this, in, this, uh, in this age, by the way, I didn't say, I, I showed that carbon dioxide was increasing. I really didn't say why. Uh, it's because of uh, combustion of fossil fuels is the reason why. Um, and so we think of this as the, you know, the, the, uh, the, we call this anthropogenic climate change. Some people say, well, we, you know, why are we wasting time measuring the sun? Um, one could argue because this balance argument that measuring the sun is more important than it ever has been. Okay? We need these numbers ex in exquisitely fine detail and accuracy because these imbalances, this it looks like a little bit, but that's what's causing all of the sea level rise. That's what's causing the change in uh, sea ice and the loss of the, um, uh, the glaciers. Um, so, that we like to say, trying to understand Earth's climate without measuring the sun is like trying to balance a checkbook without knowing your income. You wouldn't try to do it. You can't do it. That's our income, is the sun. But uh, the, the rest of the talk, the rest of the focus is going to be on here. So, how large are these signals? Um, they're, they're pretty small. They're only this signal. So, so this comes, this is, if, if you do want to look at this imbalance, that's um, a little more than a tenth of a percent. It's maybe two tenths of a percent of this, right, per year. So in a decade, it's a couple of percent, okay? Um, water vapor's been increasing over the last century. Water vapor's been increasing. These are, these, are model cal these are models that go backwards and say that water vapor's been increasing in the atmosphere. Remember I said water vapor is probably the most important greenhouse gas. And then in the last couple of decades, we have microwave measurements that can verify the increase of water vapor. And there it is there, four tenths of a kilogram per meter squared. Um, if you condensed all of the, the water in the, in the atmosphere, um, you'd have a, you'd have a, a, a layer, a layer, a thickness of a, a slab of water about two centimeters thick, a little, little less than an inch thick. Boulder is drier than that boulder, you'd have about a half an inch. A centimeter, less than a centimeter of water in the atmosphere. This is four tenths of a millimeter. If you condense that, the change is four tenths of a millimeter. Doesn't seem like a whole lot, and maybe it isn't a whole lot. But again, that's part of this. That's part of the uh, greenhouse amplification. If you measured the change in reflection from the atmosphere due to that change in water vapor, you'd get a signal that looks like this. Okay, this is, this, is a, this is the change in reflectance. If only water vapor changes, this is, this is the solar spectrum here. Again, this is the visible part of the spectrum. This is the near-infrared. Water absorbs in the near-infrared. So you can look at changes in the signal. Over a decade, the change is less than 1%. Okay? So we see a constant, constant signal here. Climate change is about a percent per decade. Okay? You know, there's a lot of physics students um, and engineering students or former engineering students in the, in, in, uh, and current engineers in the audience, people who make measurements. You know that making an instantaneous measurement of 1% is not easy, right? People who have taken their last 1% measurement is not necessarily an easy measurement to make. Here we're saying we have to make a 1% measurement and we have to maintain that for a decade. 
with an instrument that's up in space, you have no chance of getting up there and calibrating it, even on the space station, by the way. We don't have astronauts who can go out and shine lamps in our instruments, um, unfortunately. So this is, this is a challenge. Um, but this is the challenge of, 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 of observing climate. And a challenge that, th that we're meeting too, by the way, believe it or not. And then it gets even more complicated than that, okay? You could measure these, so, so we're saying we have a trend, we have to measure, we have to make a measurement of about 1% over a decade, to, to, to see a 1% change over a decade. But it's, but it's more complicated than that because there's variability in the atmosphere. There's what we call natural variability in the atmosphere. And we have to be able to measure our signal that, that exceeds that natural variability. Remember we said climate? Climate is a daily change, seasonal change, even annual change. But there's, there's natural aspects of climate that oscillates. And so the climate for one year won't exactly be like another year and the next year. And we have to look at trends that exceed those. So this is what this diagram shows. This is just looking at changes in reflectance from the Earth. What this gray, this gray patch here shows, this is the range that this, the reflection from the Earth will naturally vary. Okay, will naturally vary by this amount. The red is the actual change in reflectance. And you can see that it's trending downward, but it oscillates quite a bit. And it's not until you get past this, you get a, a, a change that's greater than the natural variability that you can actually tell, okay, now we know for sure that it really is changing. This is not just natural variability. We'll look at the time scale. That took 30 years to get that, okay? There's a lot of people, I'm not a climate modeler, but there's a lot of climate modelers that say that we don't have 30 years to wait, to make observations, to know, to detect these trends. And so that is the basis of this figure, which looks a little complicated and is a, is a little complicated, but I, let me just explain it this way. So there on the previous, we, we showed how long it took to detect that trend in the change of reflectance of Earth. Um, so that's what this is. This, 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 is, this is how long it takes to observe a trend. And this is how accurate we want to measure the trend on this scale. So let's say if we want to measure a trend to 1%, and again, that's a, nice, that's a nice threshold, then we would go across here and see how long it takes. These different curves have to, uh, are all for different levels of accuracy from our measurements. And this is, I'm gonna talk about Clario in a second here. This is what we're shooting for. Something like 3 tenths of a percent. That's the blue curve here. That means that we could measure a 1%, a trend with an accuracy of 1% in about a decade, okay? Currently, what we do is more like two, three tenths of a percent, all of these dash curves out here. Meaning with our current observing system, it takes about 30 years to observe a trend. Do we have 30 years? Uh, again, a lot, of, a lot of experts don't think that we do. So this is the basis for this for this new mission. And it's called CLARIO, it stands for Climate Absolute Radiance and Refractivity Observatory. Uh, the, um, the, the purpose is to establish a high accuracy benchmark record, really improve the accuracy of our measurements. Uh, the measurements of reflected solar radiation, emitted infrared radiation, uh, and uh, 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 GPS satellites, I won't, I won't uh, uh, talk in, deta in any detail about those two. We're focusing on this part because this is the part that last is doing reflected solar radiation. We also want high information content in this data. Um, I won't spend much time on that, but what this means is we have to measure over more wavelengths than we're currently doing. Um, this is a, uh, uh, anyway, that's, th this, uh, this is a mission that was um, part of the uh, uh, NASA's, uh, what they call decadal survey in 2007, where they prioritized uh, our missions for the next decade. This was supposed to be a tier one mission, something that we were absolutely supposed to do. Uh, more about that in a minute. Um, I am running out of time, so I won't go into detail about this, other than to say that for the first time, our measurements will be measuring the entire spectrum of solar radiation 
And because of that, we will be able to resolve many more variables that are impacting climate. Okay, not only the gases, carbon dioxide, water vapor, um, but aerosols, uh, particles in the atmosphere. Um, clouds aren't even listed on here, but we'll also be able to resolve uh, the surface, uh, the impacts of surface, clouds, vegetation, water, sea ice, um, things like that. Uh, where is Clario now? Well, Clario um, didn't make it, really make it past 2010 um, because of losses, uh, loss of funding. But in 2006, the 2016 budget, which passed about a year ago, um, uh, was decided that, well, we won't do the full Clario mission, but we're going to do something called the Clario Pathfinder. We're going to put an instrument on the space station uh, and we'll measure um, both the reflected solar radiation and we'll measure the uh, infrared um, radiation to space. Um, when we started in April, we cut the infrared. We're only doing the uh, reflected solar radiation. Um, for last, that was okay because this is, this is the last component to this mission. This is what we're building. So this is a smaller mission. This is sort of to demonstrate what we can do uh, when we have full capability for the full Clario mission. Um, and so here is the, uh, what we call the uh, reflected uh, solar spectrometer on the space station. Uh, interestingly enough, um, this is just below the truss for where the TSIS instrument uh, is uh, on the space station. Um, this, uh, this is ELC-1, ELC-3 is right above there. Um, I have a little movie of this. And, and how, do we, how do we make these improved measurements? How do we make measurements so much more accurately than we did before? The way we're going to do it is we're going to reference to the sun. Okay, here, here, here are um, reflected, or, or, uh, reflecting spectra from the Earth. Okay, for uh, about the largest we'll see is from a cloud that's in the blue here. About the the the, the, the lowest reflectance we'll see is in the black over um, dark ocean. Uh, but we're going to reference the sun, which uh, is like a very stable lamp source um, that we have access to. Um, as often as we as we need, uh, and uh, we can now reference these to this. This is stable. We can reference these to, to that. The only challenge is, and it's not a, it's not a small challenge. This is five orders of magnitude, a uh, hundred thousand times larger signal than these. Okay, so somehow we have to be able to measure the sun, reduce and and, and attenuate the signal down to these levels. Okay. The, the primary way we do that is we look at the sun with a small aperture, we look at the earth with a larger aperture. There's other ways that we actually um, implement to, to reduce the signal. Um, this has already been tested. It's been tested in the laboratory and in the field on high altitude balloons. Um, Greg Kopp uh, uh, was the lead on what we call an instrument incubator program. Uh, it's a NASA program for developing technologies. And um, this, uh, this uh, was actually tested on a balloon where the spectrometer did point at the sun and point at the earth and transfer that uh, calibration of the sun to the instrument and reference the reflectance uh, from the earth to the sun. And again, at very high accuracy. Uh, our data is very, we're, we're very rich in information because we have a lot of wavelengths and so we, what we, we call this a data cube, it's three dimensions. Two dimensions in space, so there you see this, the two dimensions in space are uh, a layer of this cube and uh, if we, every layer is, is for a different wavelength. So wavelength is varying uh, across the vertical here and um, so we flipped, uh, I could, yeah, it's, we, yeah, we didn't flip the, the, the image here. So this is, this is one face of this cube. Um, and this would, be, this would be like a single snapshot that we measure. Um, and so this is across the direction that the spacecraft is traveling. So, uh, so this is, a, this is a, a spatial direction here. On the space station, this is going to be about uh, 70 kilometers. 
and this is wavelength varying vertically. And then as we move the spacecraft along, this is called a push broom method of sampling. We keep um, adding on layers of the cube this way and build up the data cube. Uh, I have a little video of the a simulation that somebody did, Pat. Actually, I'm going to go to the next one because it's even better. It, uh, this actually has uh, thesis on it as well. This is pretty cool. Um, thesis again flies in next year. This will fly hopefully by 2020. Uh, and this will show both instruments. So. Here is, here is the instrument uh, on this uh, platform called ELC-1. It's pointing off Nader. Okay, another important aspect of this mission, it's going to calibrate, because its accuracy is so high, it's going to calibrate some of those other sensors that you saw in, in that, uh, or, uh, that diagram that I showed you of the Earth Observing System. So that was looking, um, it was scanning off the Nader point and doing calibrations. Now it's in eclipse, we're, we're in darkness, um, and we're getting ready for sunrise. We're gonna actually look at the sun to do our solar calibrations, and that's what's coming up right here. There's sunrise, and there is the sun, and I think this is the one where it looks like we're gonna saw the sun in half. There's actually two types of procedures. One where we, we move the, the slit of the instrument along the sun. That's to uh, calibrate all of the pixels, the other, t the other way we go across the sun to actually measure the total power of the sun. We actually, do, we're back doing, uh, well now we're gonna track the moon, because we also use the moon for calibration. Um, the moon is actually an excellent calibration source, and so if we're scanning across the moon, and we're gonna do an across uh, slit scan as well. Here, and Okay, so now we return, we're looking at the Earth, and now we're going to see this simultaneously with Tesis. Uh, so, Clario Pathfinder Reflected Solar and Tesis. So now both instruments are looking at the Sun. Um, okay, there's, there's the, that's the, the, the big wide cone is the total irradiance monitor on Tesis that's measuring the uh, spectrally integrated sunlight. The narrower cone is the, called the spectral irradiance monitor, measuring the, uh, the different wavelengths uh, of sunlight. And so there we're doing solar scanning. Um, Clario Pathfinder is looking uh, down below. There's Pat Brown. Um, I think I've gone way over time. I just wanted to summarize here. Climate trends, measuring climate trends are a challenge. Okay, they're, they're small signals. Um, we're not really monitoring climate trends from space right now. Hopefully we are. Um, these, are these are things that uh, are, are th 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 this type of improvement is really gonna be vital as we, uh, you know, as, as we approach, you know, the middle stages of this century. Um, uh, things, could, things could get dicey. We need information. We need information for policymakers uh, to understand uh, how we apply mitigation and adaptation procedures. Clario Pathfinder um, will attain this uh, unprecedented accuracy by directly referencing the sun. We'll reduce uncertainties by about a factor of 10. We'll measure at hundreds of wavelengths versus a few wavelengths that we currently do. And this is going to reduce the time it takes to not only detect trends, but understand what causes these trends. Um, we'll transfer high accuracy to other sensors, um, test atmospheric climate models. Uh, hopefully this Pathfinder is the, uh, is the first step to a full uh, Clario mission. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, but I've gone over and I've, I've, I've kept you 10 more minutes that you don't have to spend outside in the... Do you want to take cool. some questions, Peter? Yes, I will take questions? all the questions that you have. Sure, yeah. You're next. Yeah. When, when does Pathfinder go up? 
Uh, we're currently scheduled for 2020, and um, uh, I could give a cynical remark about what what we, you know what we would likely do now. But how, I mean, how, yeah, right now we're 2020, so <laughs> we could project, right, John? <laughs> Um, I have a question about the albedo plot. So, is albedo based on, or that plot based on our current climate models? Yeah, those were that, that was those were uh, yeah those were model projections based on a certain amount uh, a, a, a certain um, scenario for uh, a greenhouse gas emission. Okay. And so, so how were those oscillations like found? Because I mean, they were they varied quite a bit from each other. So. I don't know, I'm just curious like, um, why, how they were that precise. Let's see. Well, um, again, that, that, th those, those are just, nat that, 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 that's just the natural variability, mm -hmm. you know. So th that's natural variability riding on top of this, this decreasing trend here. And the reason, I would guess that the primary reason for this is probably loss of, loss of Christ or loss of ice because um, the uh, albedo is, uh, uh, is decreasing. But yeah, Dan Feldman, these are called uh, observing system simulating simulator experiments, mm -hmm. where you take an instrument that, that simulates a measurement of albedo uh, by looking at the Earth and the simulate, the, the Earth is, uh, the actual radiation from the Earth is, comes from simulations of a climate model, which in this case projects out to all of the 21st century. So, and I don't know exactly which one this is, but there's different scenarios. Uh, yes, sir. Well, this looks like a self-reinforcing system, namely as ice depletes uh, over, let's say, in the Arctic regions, the albedo goes down, therefore the Earth heats up, so more ice melts. It feeds on itself. Uh, my question really is... And that's only one of the... And there's several other important feedbacks. That, you know, yeah. that's a positive feedback, right. which yeah. you probably we don't want to see. Okay, my yeah, question right. is... I understand why the sun is a good calibration source. I don't understand why the moon is a calibration source. I think lots of reasons why the moon would be uh, you know, a variable source, okay. not the least being the uh, uh, you know the angle of sunlight on the moon changes the amount of reflected reflected yeah. light by a big factor. No, 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 no doubt. An excellent question uh, and. Um, I didn't go into details of that. Here's the details. The, the, the type of calibration that I showed there, um, that, that we, were, we were scanning the moon along the slit so that we can fill the entire mm -hmm. array with the same portion of the moon. All, we were, all we're doing there is flat filling. It's not actually okay. cali yeah. <laughs> it's not it's a calibration, but it's not a radiometric calibration because you're exactly right. And, well, th th that's right. Um, we have actually good relative calibrations for the moon. We do not have good absolute calibrations for the moon. It's absolute, it's about 5% for a lot of the reasons that you said. Um, and in fact, uh, if we can go long enough, the hope is that we actually will, we won't use the, we won't radiometrically calibrate the instrument with the moon, but we will hopefully um, come closer to an absolute calibration of the moon with this. So if you notice we were going, we also had a mode where we go across, we scan across the, the moon, that's actually to do the reflectance calibration of the moon, not, not by the person. So that's another, that's a lower level objective of this mission. Good question. Yeah. Uh, we have a good handle on uh, the contributions of each of the specific greenhouse gases you mentioned there, percent contribution to the total greenhouse effect, but that's something we need to improve as well. Um, what's causing the most damage? Well, the problem is uh, that, that, that water vapor is, is so highly variable, and water vapor, uh, I'm glad you brought up feedback, so the, the, and this, this is the reason for the biggest uncertainty, um, is uh, water vapor, um, uh, again, is, is, it plays in, in, in a number of, or water, I shouldn't say water vapor, water plays in a number of feedbacks. Water vapor is a pretty obvious feedback that you warm the surface, evaporate more, <coughs> put more water in the atmosphere, you'll increase the emission um, due to water vapor. Uh, and on that basis, I mean, I, th I think I, I would say, and I, I bet there's people in this audience that know the number better than me, but it, I, I think that it's almost an amplification, I believe, of about four to one 
most models would say. But there's a different thing that you could say, and I don't know the answer to this either, and this is just, just from radiation, just from spectroscopy. Um, you know, what, what, how, how, how much can you increase absorption and emission across the spectrum? I, I really don't know that. And did, do you have any ideas, Sebastian? Or, yeah. uh, but um, but what, what you, 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 have, you have these, the, the, these, these very broad um, uh, pure rotational bands at longer wavelengths that, that might be the key to actually to the entire greenhouse that could play a crucial role. Water vapors, yeah. I mean, one could argue that if we would understand water, we'd, we'd, we'd know everything about this climate. So. Any other questions? Sorry for going long. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for coming out.